Hi guys, it's Mark Zickery, Mr. Sci-Fi, also known as Mark Zickery of Space Command. And if you're new to the Mr. Sci-Fi channel, I'm a writer oh, whose credits include The Twilight Zone Companion, Star Trek The Next Generation, Deep Space Nine, Babylon 5, Sliders, on and on and on, Smurfs, He-Man, Super Friends, you name it. You can look me up on Google, Wikipedia, IMDb Pro, etc. The whole point of all of that being that I have a vast experience in science fiction, and today we are going to talk about Alien Covenant. There probably will be some spoilers. <laughs> and also the history, the untold history of Alien, because I have personal experience in uh, the development of this story and how it came to be, and I wanted to talk a little bit about the journey of Alien, because it's, uh, of course, one of the most amazing science fiction franchises in movie history, very interesting journey. And, uh, well, let's just talk about it for a few minutes. And I saw the movie yesterday, and it's a very fun movie. Uh, Ridley Scott is certainly an incredibly talented director. And um, uh, it's, it's well worth seeing, but it's a uh, goofy, goofy movie in its way. Uh, less goofy than Prometheus, of course, but still uh, it has many flaws as well as some, some interesting strengths. Uh, so, but let me, let me go way back to the beginning of Alien, because <clears throat> for those of us seeing it now who weren't there at the beginning, the movie, of course, came out in 1979, so if you're... Uh, not a middle-aged or older person, you will not have experienced it from the beginning. And at the beginning, it was an astonishing, astonishing, revelatory film, unlike anything that had gone before. And there were two ways in which this was the case. And let me, let me just get into that. And I'll, I'll talk about a, a little bit about my personal history with Alien. So, um, so here we go. So imagine, if you will, <laughs> as Rod used to say, uh, that you're a teenager and it's the 1970s, and you're um, invited, because you hang out with sort of an artsy crowd, and you're into science fiction. Uh, this was during the early 70s, and so it was still the last gasp of the counterculture and the hippie era and all of that. And I was invited to a uh, debut party for a new counterculture newspaper. Uh, there, were, there, was, there were a number of free papers that were given out across the country. One of them was the Free Press, uh, the Los Angeles Free Press, which was a, a very renowned culture, culture, countercultural newspaper. <clears throat> and so there was a, uh, another alternative paper that had just debuted as its competitor. And, there was a, uh, and so I was invited to the party. Uh, of the opening and it was held in a restaurant and there were these benches and we were all sitting at benches and tables and having beverages and whatever food they put out and on my right I was uh, maybe 15 maybe something like that on my right there was a you know 300 pound hell's angel with a long knife on his belt really a big beard really a scary looking guy and uh, on my left, there was a milder looking person. And uh, so I decided to talk to the milder looking person. I think this is probably soon after Altamont, the, uh, the very famous Ro Rolling Stones concert where uh, the Hells Angels had been hired as security and they had ended up knifing somebody. And so, so sitting next to a Hells Angel guy with a long knife was, uh, was a little bit scary. And so, and uh, though, though not, not hugely, I mean, it was, you know, he was at a party. I didn't expect anything was going to happen. But there was a nicer looking guy on my left. So I thought, okay, I'll talk to the nicer looking guy on my left, who, was, who had a beard as well and, and shaggy, slightly longish hair. And he, but he had a nice smile on his face. He seemed like a nice guy. So I started talking to him. Turned out he, his name was Ron Cobb. Now, Ron Cobb, I knew already back then, as an amazing, amazing political cartoonist. Uh, he'd been, I think he'd been doing stuff for the Free Press, but now he's also doing stuff for this other paper. And uh, the th thing that was fascinating about Ron Cobb, as well as, Ron Cobb, as well as the fact that his pol political cartoons were great, and I mean, he, had, he did one of a man wandering over a post-apocalyptic landscape, carrying a television set, looking for an, uh, looking for a, for a, an electrical outlet, and uh, you know, things like that. It was very, very funny, very pithy. And, uh, but also, something that was very distinctive about his political cartoons was they, all, they often had a science fictional bent, and he would draw aliens, and he would draw spaceships and robots, and they always looked phenomenal, really, really cool. And I loved his work. And, uh, <clears throat> and um, uh, slightly later, he would actually design uh, some of the things in Star Wars. Uh, the, uh, the Hammerhead Alien was one of his designs, based on one of his political cartoons, and also the Dewback, the, uh, the stormtrooper on the, on the giant lizard, that was another one of his designs. And, uh, but this was before all of that. And um, so I started talking to him. And we hit it off, and he took me back to his place to show me some of his artwork. And, and there along the baseboard of his apartment, just on the carpet, 
against the wall, laid, laid, against, laid on the floor against the wall, were ten paintings. And he had just been hired to do ten concept paintings. He was hired for a thousand dollars to do ten original, I believe they were oils, and, um, and uh, concept paintings for this new movie. That, that These two guys had written this script and they were trying to sell it. And he was hired as a, as a concept artist because one of them, uh, one of them had um, uh, co co written and, and starred in a little science fiction film, and Ron Cobb had become his friend, and they needed a design a design for a spaceship, and Cobb had just drawn it on a napkin and said, "Here, how about this?" And my friend Greg Jean, who I didn't know at that time, but who I later knew, he built the uh, the mothership in Close Encounters and the city in Blade Runner, which I've got part of thanks to thanks to uh, thanks to Greg. He built that ship, and that was a movie called Dark Star, <clears throat> and the writer was a young man named Dan O'Bannon, and he and Ron Shusett, who was the brother of my friend Gary Shusett, who again, I didn't know at that point, but later know, um, they had come up with a movie, an idea for a movie, and it was called Alien. And so that night, before the movie sold, I went in and I saw those 10 concept paintings that Ron Cobb had done to help sell Alien, and they were spectacular, just gorgeous, amazing. And nowadays you can go online thanks to the wonderful internet and you can actually see <clears throat> some of those paintings. And they were very, very different from what Alien would ultimately look like, at least the Alien itself. But they were evocative, they were astonishing, they were gorgeous, they were unlike anything I'd ever seen. And, uh, and this began a, a friendship with, with Ron Cobb. And, um, and so that was the beginning of Alien and the beginning of my friendship with Cobb. And where it led was that, that Dan O'Bannon ultimately sold Alien, and also on the strength of that, he uh, he was hired to do um, a, a movie called Dune. And Alejandro Jodorowsky, uh, who had, had had done a lot of very strange, freaky movies, hired Dan O'Bannon to work on the adaptation of Dune, and brought him over to uh, to Spain, and. Uh, uh, and they uh, started working on Dune. Now, Cobb was part of that, and also through that, H.R. Giger came into that project, and ultimately, that movie didn't get made. There's a wonderful documentary on, on, the, the, on the, that version of Dune, which would have been quite amazing, and there were a number of other artists who were brought aboard that project, a, um, a Mobius and uh, um, Chris Foss, another science fiction artist, and so ultimately, by then, Alien had sold. To uh, and Walter Hill and David Geiler were aboarded as producers, and and so they and, and there were several fascinating things about Alien that uh, Ron Shusett and Dan O'Bannon cooked up, and Dan, and, and Dan O'Bannon, the, you know, the film that Dan O'Bannon had first met Ron Cobb on was Dark Star, and Dark Star is a wonderfully funny science fiction film, and it's about um, uh, a crew on a ship that goes around blowing up planets, and at one point in that film. Uh, there's a beach ball uh, alien with with creature from the black lagoon, lagoon uh, hands, and this was this was a sequence shot to expand the film when it sold, and as a commercial film, they needed to pad it out, and it's about this alien getting loose on that and on that ship, and 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 the and, and the crew having to hunt it down and try and try to kill it or try to stop it, and the the germ of that became Alien because was, because that was done for comedic effect, but Dan O'Bannon started thinking about well what would happen if it wasn't comedic, and there were a number of science fiction stories that were an influence on this. There was um, a film, a sort of hokey film from the 50s called It the Creature from Beyond Space. There was a, a, a story by um, A.E. Van Vogt, a, a novel called Voyage of the Space Beagle. All sorts of odds and ends. Dan O'Bannon was a huge science fiction nerd, and, uh, but ultimately he and Ron Shusett cooked up Alien. And, but the brilliant idea they came up with was you, the question always is, what's scary? What haven't we seen before? Because horror has been done and done and done and done. And to actually scare an audience with something fresh is very, very difficult. And they looked to the animal kingdom for their creature. And they thought, okay, well, let's, what, what's really scary? And in the insect world, of course, there, there are insects that incubate their young in other insects. And then they burst out. And that was a very, very scary idea that had never been done in film anywhere, ever. So, okay, so here's Dan O'Bannon working on Dune. Dune collapses and doesn't get made, but by then, Ridley Scott has come aboard Alien. <clears throat> now, Ridley Scott had come out of advertising. He, he, he was a really talented artist in his own right. He could draw, he, could, he had a great visual imagination, and, he, um, he had, he, and so he came aboard 
Alien, and he started drawing storyboards, his own storyboards of Alien. And when the studio saw the amazing storyboards he was doing, they doubled the, bu the budget. They just said, this is going to be a great film. And, um, but meantime, Dan O'Bannon was brought back onto Alien, and he had a recommendation for all of these artists that he'd been working with. And he brought that to Ridley Scott. And Ridley Scott, this is all coming off Alejandro Jodorowsky's Dune. And Ridley Scott saw these artists and, of course, knew they were spectacular. But the one thing, again, that was revolutionary about Alien was that every film that had gone before, every film and TV show in, in the science fiction realm that had gone before, the art department worked on every aspect of the, the visuals. So, for instance, on Star Trek, the same art department designing the, the, the Enterprise uh, uniforms and ships and, and hand weapons, those might be designed by different individuals, but they were the same art team. So, so for instance, the Klingon ship and, you know, and the Klingon uniforms are going to be similar in design aesthetic to the, the Enterprise crew and the Enterprise um, ship, you know, the, the uniforms in the ship, because it's the same aesthetic and the same team. And they might try for something that looks somewhat different, and they did. The Klingon ship is a great design, as is the Enterprise, but they're still sort of in the same aesthetic universe. But with Alien, the brilliant idea, the brilliant, brilliant idea was that they would have a completely different artist and aesthetic working on the Alien stuff from the artist's working on the human stuff. So Ron Cobb was heading up design of the Nostromo and the, the, the human ship, and, and so it's Chris Foss and Mobius and, 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 and Cobb working on all of the human things, the spacesuits, etc. And then it was H.R. Giger, the brilliant and crazy Swiss artist H.R. Giger, working to design the alien and the alien ship, because of course he was doing very creepy sexualized biomechanical designs in his paintings and his drawings, very disturbing. And so he brought that all to Alien. And so when you saw Alien, you saw something that was completely unlike anything you'd ever seen before in a film. And the, and the fact that the, everything on the human side had one design aesthetic and on the alien side had a totally different and very disturbing aesthetic made you feel that you were truly going into an alien place somewhere you'd never been before. And that was terrific. So, so let me take you back to 1979 and talk about what Alien was like to see where there was no no knowledge of it beforehand, because although I'd met Ron Cobb and seen those original, original paintings of Alien, I hadn't read the script, I hadn't been in on the shooting of the movie, I did not know what the story was, and because I didn't know Dan O'Bannon. Uh, and so, and by then, of course, Ron Cobb had gone on, and was working on Star Wars and so forth, so I saw the painting he did for John Milius that was of a, of an, it, John Milius had said he wanted a painting that looked like a National Geographic photograph of an alien planet, an alien terrain. So Cobb had done this amazing painting of an a, of an sort of an alien Arab kind of guy, all sh all all wreathed in 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 robes, sitting on top of a giant lizard on a desert landscape, and it was a superb painting. And then George Lucas saw that painting as Milius, and all these people knew each other, Spielberg and and so forth, uh, Francis Ford Coppola. They were all, all pals and and hung out. George Lucas, and um, uh, so so George Lucas saw that painting and said, okay, well, I want to use that in Star Wars, which he did, and he used the hammerhead in uh, the alien the Cobb designed in, in the cantina scene. But anyway, back to Alien. So, okay, so, Alien comes out, well, Star Wars comes out in 1977, and of course it's a, uh, it's a change in everything. Everything changes then, because they, the studios now see that they can do a very different kind of science fiction movie that will appeal to the masses. 2001 had been a hit, but it had been sort of a one-off. You, you weren't going to see... Um, a lot of film. It wasn't a popular entertainment. It was a it was a challenging film and sort of an art film, even though it was expensive. And um, but but Star Wars. They said okay, every studio wanted a Star Wars. So then so Paramount started putting into production Star Trek: The Motion Picture, and of course 20th Century Fox. Well, when Ridley Scott saw Star Wars, he realized it was a whole different thing. And he also saw um, 2001, and these were huge influences on him. And uh, so instead of doing Tristan and Isolde, which was the film he was working on after The Duelist, his first feature, he switched over to Alien. So, so okay, so Alien goes into production. And it's, uh, and so the, they rolled it out. Before it came out in theaters, they decided to roll it out at the World Science Fiction Convention, just like the, the World Science Fiction Convention, just like Gene Roddenberry had showed the, shown the pilot of Star Trek before it aired at the World Science Fiction Convention to get the buzz going among science fiction fans. That's what they did with uh, Alien. So they took us all to a big uh, auditorium theater, huge, and 
they screened Alien. Now, there was no knowledge of what this film was going to be, nothing. So none of us were prepared for what we were going to see. <laughs> so it was one of the scariest films I ever saw in my life because, first of all, it wasn't in the main the, the tropes of, of science fiction films as we were used to them. There were no, it wasn't on Earth. It wasn't in a creepy house. You know, it's funny because certain science fiction writers had tried to combine the horror and science fiction genres. One of them was Richard Matheson. Richard Matheson wrote a wonderful episode of, of Twilight Zone called Death Ship. And in that, he was trying to combine the horror and science fiction modes. It was about three astronauts who land on an alien planet and find a duplicate of their own ship crashed and their own dead bodies in that ship. And they have to decide if they're dead, if it's aliens pulling some kind of tele telepathic hoax on them, like, like Ray Bradbury did in Mars is Heaven, in the Martian Chronicles, uh, or what. And it was horrific, but mainly intellectually horrific, not, not hugely scary where, you know, you can't sleep that night. But Alien was a very different thing because the, everything about it was disquieting, uh, alarming, and you know, you're watching it and it starts slowly. They, go, they find the, the alien ship, they go into it. And then of course the, the first big scare is when the, uh, the face hugger attacks John Hurt. And, and of course when it, when it bursts out of his chest, that was just, I remember, because you, again, you don't know what's, what's coming. And when that happened, I was in the audience with thousands of, of, of attendees from the World Science Fiction Theater, all the top science fiction writers. And I was sitting in the row behind Harlan Ellison, the great writer of City on the Edge of Forever for Star Trek. And when that happened, all of us, including Harlan, jumped a foot, jumped a foot. It was, and the feeling of it was, the feeling of the film was, I have no idea what's going to happen. It was deeply scary and deeply disturbing and just a phenomenal film and at the end we gave it a, a thundering ovation because we knew we had seen something that was new, totally new and fresh and spectacular and wonderful and amazing and just just a masterpiece and uh, and of course Sigourney Weaver that put her on the map and, uh, and, and, and again unlike many bad films, bad horror films where people just get knocked off for no good reason, in this one the bravest, smartest person survives. And, and many of you know that, uh, that originally that, that role was supposed to be a male role and, and they made it a female role, which was great, and they didn't change the lines. And so again, um, she was strong and she was tough. And she's the one who says, you know, don't let it in. It could infect the ship, it, it, you know, quarantine. And it, again, it was following a very interesting biological model that we had never seen in a film before, never, never, never. And, um, and they were trying to think of, okay, how does it work? It incubates, on, it has these eggs, it incubates in human beings, it then sheds its skin like a snake and grows. Very clever, very, very clever. And so, so that was the first one. And then it was many years before there was a, 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 second, a second film. And in that case, James Cameron was very, very smart in not just repeating the tropes of the first film. What he did was he took the design tropes of the first film and he made it an action film. And that was, again, brilliant. He changed genres. And, uh, and in that case, I, I love Aliens. It's, it's, it's one of my favorite films. And Alien is a great film as well. But Aliens, what I loved about it was he was very influenced by Starship Troopers, by Heinlein, the novel, not the movie. It hadn't come out yet. And uh, it's just a thrilling, wonderfully realized film, very distinctive characters. And again, in that one, the smart people survive. The people who have the best hearts, the biggest hearts, survive. So compassion rules the day, bravery rules the day, honor rules the day, and people are intelligent. They act intelligently. And, um, and that was one thing where Alien, one of, one of the few sins that Alien committed was that Alien had a cat and they go after the cat and they're looking for the cat and in reality you're going, no, don't, don't leave the cat for God's sake. And that was the one, and that's why in the in the second film, uh, Ripley says to the cat, "You're staying behind this time." And uh, but but those first two films, of course, were were um, just wonderful. And and if you haven't seen them, I'm sure you have, but uh, go back and see them because uh, you will be well served. Now then, of course, Alien went into its long period of of lesser returns, and. Um, and, you know, the third film was very troubled, and it's a fast... You know, if you read up on any of the Alien films, uh, you'll find it very interesting, the, the development problems, the challenges. You know, the second film... The, third, the second film came out wonderfully. Third film... And, it, and, by the way, a friend of mine was on the studio lot, 20th Century lot, when uh, he was a executive producer on 
TV shows and uh, a writer, very talented writer, and doing features as well. And an executive at, at one point came to him and said, we've got a script and I wanted you to read it and give me your thoughts. And he read it, my friend Jane, Joe Dougherty read it, and he said, it's perfect. And the executive said, yes, that's what I thought. And it was the script for Aliens, and they greenlit it and made it. <laughs> but he read it before it was even shot. So um, then, then Alien 3 had all of its problems, and you know, with the wood planet and being in development for a long time, and, and on and on. And, um, you know, and not a great film, very problematical, but a very interesting cast, a good try. And then Alien 4, which was written by Joss Whedon, is interesting in several ways. It's actually not a bad script at all, but the director is the, is the French director of uh, uh, City of Lost Children, and he has this strange French sense of humor that really doesn't work with the material. And, uh, and so I think the director is at cross purposes with the material. But again, I like the cast very much. I like Winona Ryder. I like uh, Sigourney Weaver is terrific, of course. Some of the other casting choices are not great. Ron Perlman is a very powerful presence. But, um, but if you watch it, and look, it's not a bad script at all. And it's a very interesting script because, again, it's doing something different from the first film and the second film. And, uh, and I, I rather like that film, though some of the design elements are, are poor. Uh, some of the design elements are great, but also, if you, if you look at it as the pilot of uh, Firefly sat, slash Serenity, that makes it very interesting, because when you realize it's about sort of this, this ship of, of rogues and renegades and freebooters, and, uh, and you say, well, hmm, that's really interesting, because that's, that sort of is like what became Firefly slash Serenity. And I like Serenity very much. And uh, so if you view it in that way of Joss Whedon trying out ideas, then it becomes quite, quite fun and quite interesting. The one problem, the big problem, with, um, with, the, with the fourth Alien film is, you, ha you, you have to top yourself. You have to, in a horror film or an action film, you have to top yourself progressively. You don't, you don't have a big monster and then end with a smaller monster. And that's what the fourth Alien film does. It has this sort of human-alien hybrid that's really awful looking. The design is terrible. And it ends up just kind of being a big, babyish, non-monster, sort of kind of monster thing. So whereas Aliens was smart enough to realize, and the first Alien film too, you start with a smaller creature and then get a bigger one. So in, in the first Alien film, it's the alien um, baby, basically, the, the, the embryo uh, that bursts out of the chest. And, and then it becomes the giant monster, which is, again, a huge surprise. And the, the, the little creature moves very quickly to escape, and then the big creature moves very slowly and very ominously. Because any, any horror movie, you have, to say, you have to say, do my monsters move slow or do they move fast? This is, again, a, a prime issue in zombie movies. Uh, fast zombies versus slow zombies. And in Alien Covenant, it's a fast monster. It moves quickly. But, again, not that believably. It seems kind of CG. And uh, whereas in the second Alien film, Aliens, it was like, okay, they have, you've seen the alien, and you have a whole bunch of them, and then you have the alien queen, which again is a superbly designed monster, and it's bigger, and it's scarier, and it's, it's a terrific way to top it, and have the movie have a satisfying conclusion. The fourth alien film has a lesser conclusion, which makes it a disappointing ending. And then you have the, two, the, the, the alien versus predator movies, which are... What, whatever you know, the first one's better than the second one, but again, it's kind of like, like they're almost like wrestling. It's like, oh, this team up with that team up. You know, it's just film. You know, franchises are always in trouble where they bring, you know, someone from a, from someone or something from a different franchise and combine them. It's kind of like they're they're running on fumes, and so they just do that to squeeze some more dollars out of the audience. And you know, you're not going to get great work generally out of that. And I've never particularly liked Predator. It's just it seems like like sort of a half-assed alien to me. And, um, but, you know, but, but again, if, they, if, if they're your cup of tea, terrific. So then we get to Prometheus. Now, it's fascinating because really Scott, again, comes back to science fiction. And Prometheus is a gorgeously designed film. I've, I've talked about it in other Mr. Sci-Fi videos. And if you turn the sound off and just watch the visuals, it's gorgeous. It's terrific. I often turn it on just as video wallpaper. I love the visuals in Alien. And the cast is many wonderful actors. Uh, I particularly like Charlize Theron and Michael Fassbender in that film. And in fact, before the movie came out, they were on a panel at a science fiction convention with Ridley Scott. And when you see them up close, they are astonishingly, astonishingly beautiful human beings. And, and I'm so glad that Charlize Theron got uh, Fury Road, Mad Max Fury Road, because she is a wonderful action heroine and, and, and intelligent and powerful and phenomenal. And she finally got... Because, because in the, for, for me, part of the problem in... Um, and Prometheus is that when, you know, when the characters come out of hypersleep, 
she immediately goes and does push-ups and is tough and she's worried about the rest of the crew any, any you know anyone killed no and and she should be the heroine she's the interesting strong tough one and she's the one i want to take the journey with whereas whereas the actress you know nomi rapace uh, who's uh, supposedly playing a Brit, but has, but of course has a Swedish accent, uh, is, you know, she's throwing up and, and she's just, you know, she's behind the play throughout and just kind of dumb and, and being knocked around and, and just, you know, not tough. And again, this is, a, this is something that in the initial alien films they saw, have a strong heroine, have her be smart, have her be tough, have her be compassionate, have her be brave, you know, have her be concerned about other people you know, very, very good, very, very good. And this is a mistake they made in Prometheus. There's lots of mistakes in it, and we could go on and on about that, but you, I'm sure you, you have the same problems with it I do. You know, if you, have, if you have this alien, white, sickly, white, gray, boa constrictor thing come out of this black goop, you're not going to go, hey, pretty, pretty, hey, pretty, pretty, because obviously it's going to kill you. I mean, <laughs> what else is going to happen? You know, and you're a scientist, you're going to do that? No, 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 no. May, you know, it's uh, Damon Knight, who was one of my teachers at Clarion, uh, the Clarion Writers Workshop, he was a great science fiction writer. He wrote to serve man which was made into a great twilight zone episode he, he referred to something called the idiot plot and the idiot plot is a plot that only works if everyone in it acts like an idiot and that's certainly prometheus and uh and now we get to alien covenant now see here's another part of part of this whole thing that's very very interesting which is that um when when we saw the first alien movie there are questions that arise in the first alien movie and it naturally led to sequels and James Cameron came up with a great idea for the sequel, which is, okay, what are the questions that first movie engenders? Well, one big question, of course, is what laid those eggs? Because clearly, there's the little alien, and then there's the big one, and, you know, is there something else that laid the eggs? And f again, following the insect analogy, he came up with the idea of the, the alien queen laying all of, the, all of those eggs. So again, a great idea, great extrapolation of the, of the, of the um, physiology of that species. And that was clever and it really worked and uh, and it made sense but Ridley Scott the question that came up to him was when they go into the alien ship and they see the dead um, alien uh, gigantic alien uh, pilot with the, with his chest burst open so clearly there was an alien that burst out of him he, Ridley Scott was saying well who were those guys now he may have been the only person who asked that question certainly it's not a question that most people ask because again that was just a scene setting thing it's an alien that was killed you assume that this that the aliens go from the monsters go from species to species incubating them and then killing them <clears throat> and so um you know so it wasn't a big question for most people for, but for really scott it was and his thought was well let's do a movie where we see those guys well, okay and so in in prometheus they turn out to be human-ish they sort of are, are, are like living versions of Michelangelo's David, which again figures in Alien Covenant. And, uh, okay, fine. I don't think it was a big question that we had on our minds, most of the audience, but fine. And Ridley Scott is, is now in, you know, 79, and he's thinking about mortality, and he's thinking about the big questions of God and the afterlife and so forth. Fine. And it's, uh, by the way, it's also very interesting the way the, the worlds of Blade Runner and Alien intersect because there's a similar graphic in, in, in the spinner and the alien and the ship, the Nostromo in, in Alien, where where it gives a little nod and there's of course of course androids in both both films. You can actually see a way of the worlds of Alien and the worlds of Blade Runner being the same world, with the one exception that they give androids a limited lifespan in Blade Runner. And uh, and you know and in and in Alien they don't have limited lifespans as far as we know. So um, but one could could put them in the same worlds and uh, the same world so that's kind of interesting and by the way moon the movie moon also could take place in the blade runner universe as well so uh though ridley scott didn't do that film but again very similar backstories and universes and attitudes so so now we come to alien covenant and there's two really great prologues to the film um, or at least really interesting prologues that you can watch online and they'll almost certainly be on the Blu-ray and DVD. One shows David and Numi Rapace, the Michael Fassbender and Numi Rapace, uh, flying to the world of the engineers, those, those alien creatures, you know, the, the ones who th theoretically engineered humanity, um, flying to their world. And it's a very nice prologue and, and interesting and, and sheds new light on the film. And then there's another little prologue with the crew on the Covenant. And again, that sheds some light on... Uh, 
on who they are, and James Franco is the captain, and you see him as the captain. Whereas uh, in the in the movie, you know, he burns to death at the beginning. Again, I said there'd be spoilers, so if you don't, if you haven't seen the movie, don't don't listen to me any further than this. But um, but it's 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 fun. It's very very fun. And here's my feeling about Alien Covenant. It's an entertaining film. It's gorgeously designed visually. There's many many things to enjoy in it, but it has such dumb things in it too. People are on, the, the, one of the worst things in horror movies, and it's a trope that we all hate, is where we know there's a monster, we know there's people being killed, and we just wander off alone to take a bath or take a shower or have sex. And of course, the monster gets us. And this is something that really Scott does again and again and again in Alien Covenant. Now, the other thing that is really bothersome in Alien Covenant, well, the one, the one good thing, by the way, is, you know, in, in Prometheus, David is infecting human beings with the alien spore. Uh, he's doing things that you say, why is he doing that? Why is he doing that? And in this film, they answer the question, which is he basically hates people, wants them to die, and is using the alien uh, weaponry, the biological weaponry of the alien species, to, uh, to wipe out people. So, okay, yeah, that sort of kind of works, though it kind of makes him a terrible, monstrous villain, crazy person, or a crazy android, but okay, fine. So, um, so, but, but, but in, but, you know, but in this film, in, in Alien Covenant, the, the other thing that is really, really, um, there's several things that are goofy, just, just, just really goofy. I mean, there's a switcheroo of, of one character for another that the, everyone in the audience, every, even little kids will know who that is and the, and the characters don't. And you just go, and again, this is the idiot plot where people are acting like idiots. What normal people would, would, would immediately leap to you know, there's there's an alien on on the on the big ship, and how did that get there? And maybe maybe who you know, it's the the, the evil Michael Fassbender, not the good one. But they don't guess that until it's too late, too late. So, um, bad idea, really bad idea. And uh, and you know, the other things about it are in aliens, in Alien and Aliens, they work out a biology that makes sense. In this movie, in Alien Covenant, the biology is like what? It's like okay, so there's the evil alien black dust that was in the ampules in, in Prometheus, but now it's in these little pods you can step on, and it releases this stuff, and it gets into your body, and then that germinates into some kind of proto-alien creature that bursts out of your back. Uh, and then, and then, but there's also the alien eggs, but there's no alien queen, and on and on and on. It's just like, it's all over the place, and it's like, what is this doing? How does this work? The rules are, are just, just loopy, just loopy. But, uh, Anyway, so that's <clears throat> that's some of it. That's some of it. Um, but so the so the bottom line is, Alien Covenant is worth seeing. It's fun. It's entertaining, but it will drive you crazy. It's not as bad as Prometheus, but Prometheus again had some brilliant things in it. So so that's that's the main stuff. And if you want to buy stuff from Alien Covenant or, or or Prometheus, you can go to the prop store, and they have stuff for sale that is very cool, but expensive, but very very cool from those movies and other films as well. But, um, but so that's the journey of Alien and Alien Covenant. There's also a really good audio, audio play um, uh, based on Alien. It's set between the first film and the second film, and the actress they have an actress who's imitating um, Sigourney Weaver and does a really good job. And you can download that from Audible. If, it, it's, it's something like Alien Out of the Shadows, something like that, and you can find it. And it's 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 fun. And there's Alien novels and Alien action figures and alien um, uh, graphic novels and all sorts of stuff. Uh, it, it is a rich world and a fascinating one. And, uh, and, but I, I'm, and I'm really um, gratified that I was there at the beginning and saw those original paintings before anybody did. And, uh, and it was, it's been just an amazing journey with this, this franchise. And, you know, and again, Ridley Scott's work has been hugely influential on me and between Alien and Blade Runner, one of my other favorite movies. And certainly in Space Command, I'm influenced. We've got synthetics, we've got all sorts of stuff happening that have similar resonances, but it's a story all its own. This is the project that I'm now in post-production on and continuing to shoot. But, uh, but so that's about it for now regarding all of the Alien journeys, the Alien franchises. There'll be more Alien films. We'll see where they go with it. But hopefully they'll, they'll you know, learn from their errors. I doubt it, you know. <laughs> You know, but uh, but they'll continue to be at least interesting, and 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 the cast, by the way, in Alien Covenant is is quite good. Um, there's some good characters, and but again, it's it's all over the place in terms of what people do and why they do it and the logic of why they do it and so on and so forth. And two more uh, parenthetical notes about Alien and the Alien franchise. Uh, essentially, the first is about Ash, 
And another big cheat in the first Alien film, one of the few cheats, is the fact that uh, Ash, the character of Ash, attacks Ripley, and we're led to believe initially that he's been taken over by the alien in trying to kill her, and then ultimately when they stop him, we discover that he's a synthetic, uh, a replicant, an, an android. And this is a uh, cheat because there's been nothing in the film before that that in any way suggests that there's um, androids in this world, synthetics, that it's, it's uh, totally out of the blue. And so that was a misdirect and a cheat. But you forgive it because the movie is so, so terrific, and, uh, and it also explains why he lets the... Uh, the uh, face hugger in to the ship because of you know who and what he is. Um, the second interesting thing around Alien is that uh, after Prometheus but before Alien Covenant it was announced that Neil Blomkamp uh, who did District 9 and Elysium was going to do his own Alien film and it was going to star Sigour Sigourney Weaver and he wanted Michael Bean in it and the basic his idea because the question always with Alien is where do you put it in the chronology so you don't have to deal with the third and fourth films which are basically considered lesser works and so his solution was to pretend that those didn't exist and just have it be a sequel to Aliens where essentially because people were very upset that Michael Bean's character and, and the character of Newt were killed uh, so uh, so uh, cavalierly at the beginning of the Alien of the third Alien film and so in this one it would be a continuation of their stories with with Ripley and that would have been cool, and um, and I've subsequently met the actress who played Newt, Carrie Henn, and she's quite wonderful, and she's now a third grade school teacher, and uh, and she's every bit as sweet and and charming as you would think from from seeing her in the film, and I have a signed photo of her as Newt on on the wall at at, at my home. So, um, but uh, but because uh, Ridley Scott decided that this, the sequel to Prometheus was going to be an alien film, uh, they pulled the pl the plug on. Uh, on Blomkamp's film, Neil Blomkamp's film, and that's a shame because that's a that's a film I would have liked to have seen. Uh, in a way, Neil Blomkamp's films have been, to, to a certain extent, diminishing returns. I love District Nine, and Elysium is two thirds of a really good movie, and then the ending is kind of very funky. And then, of course, Chappie we needn't discuss. But uh, but one always hopes with a, with a filmmaker of Neil Blomkamp's talent that he'll learn how to um, finish a film again. He'll learn how to bring that that quality of of uh, dramatic completion to a film. I have, I have great hopes for him. He's a hugely talented filmmaker and, and writer, so um, I would have liked to have seen that film, and I'd be very interested to read that script if anyone's a friend of Neil Blomkamp's. Uh, uh, reach out to him on my behalf. So that's it for now. Uh, Mark Zikri, Mr. Sci-Fi. You can subscribe to the Mr. Sci-Fi channel. More to talk about. I just went to the Drama Summit, so more to talk about regarding Space Command and all the other things that I'm up to. So that's it for now. So we will talk soon. Thanks a lot, guys. Take care. Bye-bye.